I'm all geared up. Let us hear your song. It goes something like this. Austin Butler has come a long way from auditioning at 2 a.m. while crying in a bathrobe. Now he's really singing Elvis remixes on the big screen. So yes, like many of us, Austin Butler was a shy kid. Although he had a year and a half to prepare for his role as Elvis, he still struggled with stage fright when he first walked on set and thought, my career is on the line in this moment. What helped him actually overcome his nerves though was the realization that Elvis felt the exact same way as him. Knowing that he had stage fright, knowing that he was a shy kid, all those things really impacted me a lot. And so, Austin Butler's voice was all shook up by this role. In order to get Elvis's distinct Memphis accent right, Austin isolated himself from his family for three years and worked with a voice coach, Irene Bartlett. She'd focus on finding Austin's natural talent as well as building a true connection with the personality of Elvis, rather than turning into an Elvis impersonator. Austin went on to say that he felt as though he'd truly lived as Elvis for three whole years. So I'm sure that there's just pieces of my DNA that will always be linked in that way. So how did Austin win the role of Elvis anyway? Well, we can tell you one thing. What? It was unlike any audition. Austin sent director Baz Luhrmann his first audition video, but he worried that it had gone really bad. After waking up from a nightmare one day, he thought about the fact that he and Elvis had both lost their mothers at a young age, and he came up with a great idea. What what if I sing Unchained Melody to mom? So crying in the middle of the night and wearing nothing but a bathrobe at his piano, Austin recorded his second audition video and it was this that ultimately got the attention of Baz. Over his many decades of fame, Elvis's look definitely evolved a lot. So to help Austin keep up with the times, we had the most incredible prosthetics team. For Elvis's more youthful look in the 1950s, there weren't a lot of prosthetics that they applied, other than cheekbones and some chin pieces that were meant to just keep him fresher and a bit more round-faced. But for the 1960s, they also had to add jaw prosthetics, just to harden his jaw line a little bit and make it more pronounced. But his most dramatic change, however, doesn't come until the film jumps to 1977, when he needed full face, chest, and neck prosthetics. Unlike the other Elvis biopics, this one wasn't afraid to shake things up. The soundtrack included a number of tracks from modern popular artists, and a lot of them offer their own spin on Elvis's classic sound. Doja Cat's song Vegas, for example, takes influence from Elvis's song Hound Dog, while Tame Impala offers us a remix of Edge of Reality. So like, discussing the film's mashup of Viva Las Vegas with Britney Spears' Toxic, Baz Luhrmann explained that her song was chosen because he saw a direct line between Elvis's journey and Britney's journey. So Baz invited a group of Nashville gospel singers on set for the film. These people aren't actors. This music you can't fake. Among this group was Shanka Ducare, a gospel singer who had been performing in Nashville churches since she was a child. Shanka thought she was a little more than an extra when she showed up on the set for the first day, but her talent was so undeniable that she was offered the role of Big Mama Thornton. Chunka said in order to really pay tribute to her, I had to tap into myself, my own self-confidence, my own voice, because she was very adamant that she only had her voice. No one could sing like her and she sang like no one. Baz had to listen to over 800 Elvis tracks to pick out the right ones. Rather than choosing songs based on personal favorites or biggest hits, Baz needed to make sure that every Elvis song that made it into the movie suited the story in some way. And according to to him. And it's really difficult because there are so many, just what I would call gems. Austin Butler sang a ton of the songs that Elvis recorded during his earlier career, considering many of the songs were recorded on acetate, making it impossible to separate his voice from the instruments. Yet, some songs from the film, like Unchained Melody, actually use Elvis's original vocals. As Baz pointed out, you want to understand that you're actually hearing the words of Elvis, like, just a few weeks before he passed passes away. So Austin Butler had some big blue suede shoes to fill. Before taking on the role of the king, Austin felt the need to meet Priscilla Preston
previously, explaining that he felt a responsibility to his family, as well as a responsibility to bring the humanity to an icon around whom there are so many misconceptions. And although Austin was nervous about what Priscilla would think of the film, he had nothing to worry about. Well, I mean, he was amazing in the film. I'm just gonna come out with it. Wow, does Priscilla's style ever say a lot about who she is? Olivia de Jong explains that her wardrobe in the 1950s was meant to reflect the fact that she doesn't fully know herself yet. And so as Priscilla's aging throughout the 60s, we see that Elvis has a lot of say in what she's wearing and how she's dressing. But it's actually her fashion in the 70s where things really get interesting. So Olivia explained, she's taking a hold of her life she's freer, meaning that every scene was kind of a different look. It was these styles in particular that Olivia adored wearing. These lashes and this, the big hair, I, I really hope that it comes back. Yeah, us too. So Olivia was feeling a lot like Bambi at the beginning of filming. It kind of felt like I was bumping around and I didn't know how to center myself. Yet, Olivia found herself gaining a lot of confidence after three years of filming. And it sounds corny, but truly I felt like a changed woman. And the way she explained it, I feel way more grounded, way more centered, and way more in touch with my femininity. I also have a whole new appreciation for aesthetics, fashion, hair, and makeup. So who exactly was Colonel Tom Parker? Baz Luhrmann admitted that he was originally inspired to write the script because the way he saw it, there would have been no Elvis without Colonel Tom Parker. Because if Elvis represents the soul and the new in America, the Colonel represents the cell. And Tom Hanks was feeling this fresh and unexpected approach. I don't know what Colonel Tom Parker looks like. He's never been identified as anything other than this mercurial or puppeteer-like quasi-evil greedy manager that took advantage of Elvis from the get-go. And now we get to the most important part. Baz Luhrmann was obsessed with getting Elvis's hair just right. Actually, one of Baz's most famous quotes on set was, the hair has spoken, so can we roll the cameras? <laughs> Referring to the moment when Austin Butler's hair looked just right. Austin's real hair was used for any scenes taking place during the 50s, although they did have to dye it to achieve Elvis's iconic shade of black. But for his most famous pompadour in the 70s, they actually needed multiple wigs, with Baz's one request being that they keep making it higher. Get it higher, higher, higher. No celebration of Elvis can be complete without a trip to Graceland. Austin Butler paid a visit to the estate before filming even started. And I went in there and I spent the whole day in there by myself and it was just amazing. The crew was able to see the blueprints from Graceland's architectural design so that they were able to better build a set that recreated Graceland in certain time periods as accurately as they possibly could. You walk in through this door and you feel like you're right in the real life Graceland. For all the surprises that made it to the big screen, there was much more going on in Elvis behind the scenes. How successful do you think the movie was in capturing the music and the magic of the king? Don't forget to make your thoughts heard down below.